All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out to the uh, measuring engineering teams uh, panel that we have here. Uh, so we're going to let the speakers introduce themselves. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Code Climate, who provided some sweet swag that Steve brought here. Uh, so Code Climate has a product called Velocity that Steve and his team have been using to uh, gather some data out of GitHub and some other tools to help make good decisions about engineering management. So uh, that's part of what we'll talk about up here. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm Kyle Shipley. Uh, this is my, one of my co-founders at a company called Woven, Anthony Panazzo. Um, so we're gonna be moderating this panel. We spent all day slaving over a great set of questions uh, that we probably won't get to, because we'll get sucked into discussion, so. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll pass it along. Uh, so tell us your name, uh, what company you're representing here, and uh, when you decided to sell your soul and become a manager. <laughs> I sold my soul a long time ago, but not for a uh, Andrew Robinson, I uh, am representing. See, I put on a Lessonly shirt, but then I realized in the middle of the day, it doesn't say Lessonly on it, so you'll just have to trust me that this is a Lessonly shirt. Um, but yeah, I represent Lessonly. Um, I've been coding, can I talk about before sure. I sold my soul? I've been coding for, uh, since high school, so around 1996, I think is where I wrote my first line of code. Um, but, uh, I have sold my soul. I was doing the player coach model for about the last eight to nine years, and about four years ago, four years ago, I sold my soul completely. Uh, where I'm not, I'm no longer a professional engineer. I still slang the codes every once in a while, but uh, not professionally anymore. So that is me. Hey, everybody. Steve Caldwell, VP of Technology at Springbuck. Um, Started coding, you got a few years on me. 99, I was in the web design club. Uh, <laughs> that's what I do. I was a nerd. I don't know people let me know. Front page 95, I think. Front page 95. Yeah. Let's throw it back. Um, I started doing professional software development in 2008 for Department of Defense, building lots of stuff that I can't talk about for a few years. And then I left that job to start a company in 2012, an agency. Uh, did the agency thing for a few years, then did a SaaS company, raised a little bit of VC, failed miserably, and then joined Springbuck. Uh, so I was sort of a technical CEO a couple times around, and then uh, in the, over the last five years, sort of most teams I'm on don't let me code anymore, uh, but uh, enjoying building teams that build really cool shit. So. But hi, <laughs> I'm Lindsay Ashburn. I work for Conga. I'm the development manager there. I've only been a development manager for about six months, and I think it kind of happened accidentally. So I'm not really sure that I sold my soul on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually did start coding back in 1999 um, with QBasic in high school. <laughs> And then I was like, hey, that's cool. Um, I'm just going to be a CS major. And that was way different than what I expected. <laughs> um, but it was fun. And then after that, I did a variety of things, uh, configuration management and QA, and then kind of project management. And I was a stay-at-home mom for five years, and then back into QA, and now uh, development management. So I'm here to learn as much as I am to contribute. Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I am the CTO of Pattern 89. I uh, used to work at Salesforce via a series of acquisitions. I used to run uh, engineering for a company called Agua Digital. Um, so I've been uh, managing teams for, for quite a while. Um, been running software for a really long time. Uh, I, uh, I prefer the player coach model. Um, I don't have the patience to be a full-time manager. Um, I'm, uh, I'm what I would call a reluctant manager. So. Um, I prefer to solve problems that get solved, uh, you know, in days as opposed to the really long period it takes to solve people problems. So, uh, <laughs> Do they ever um, get solved? Uh, maybe, <laughs> yeah, probably not. So, um, yeah. So uh, we'll start off with a, a softball question here a little bit. But uh, so we're here to talk about managing, you know, measuring engineering team performance. Uh, why measure development teams at all? Like, why not just go off of how you feel? If anybody ever wants to 
take the answer first, just let me know. Uh, um, but uh, why measure at all? Um, if we don't tell the rest of the organization uh, a little bit about how effective we are at doing what we do, then it becomes really difficult for them to understand the value of software. Even at a software company, uh, one of the things that I was telling somebody the other day, even at a software company, it feels like the creation of software is undervalued. This was supposed to be a softball question, I'm taking it off deep. Yeah. Um, but uh, even at a software company, so the software development creation process is undervalued. Why? Because it's very, very difficult to understand. It's really easy to understand, not easy to do, but it's easy to understand uh, meeting or missing a quota or getting the number of MQLs you bring in per month, um, things of that nature, but in software development specifically, it's really, really difficult to quantify the value. So when you say, yeah, we need more, it's like, well, is what you have good enough? Or you know, do you, how many more do you need? So on and so forth. Uh, so it's all about um, if you're going to win together as an organization, I think you have to be able to speak to the value of every part of that organization. So, uh, what's Steve's wearing his win together t shirt? That's our that's oh, a win motto. together. That's yeah, that's yeah. That's one. Appreciate <laughs> the shout out. Uh, so, the question is why measure it all? Sure. Because my boss asked me to. <laughs> that's <laughs> much easier. <laughs> that was totally my answer. Um, so, now I got to make up something. Uh, okay, um, I would say also, so we can continue to improve, if we, if, we, if we don't know where we're coming from, then we don't know where we want to be. Yeah, I started uh, trying to do more uh, quantitative measuring recently when uh, my CEO came to me and he asked me two questions. Hey, we have uh, 50 whatever, we have X number of features in the backlog, if we wanted to get those done, twice as fast than you, twice as fast as we do now, or we want to meet some date for those features, how many engineers would you need to do that? And he didn't like the answer more. Um, <laughs> and so, like I started down this journey, so that as well as if you had one more engineer, how much more would I get? So it came to this, uh, people asking questions around, uh, you know, you know, how many, how much more am I going to get? How much faster? How can I know that if I invest more money, if you want to grow your team, what am I going to get back in return? Yeah, I think that was a really good answer. I, I kind of struggle with, uh, you know, kind of thinking like six months out or three months out or something like that. So I think, you know, coming up with something that will satisfy your boss is like not an easy, uh, you know, task. Um, so I guess, what metrics do you gather today to track the health of your development process? And maybe like for the question, maybe I'll like go off by one each time, that, that way somebody new starts each time or something. Cool, I have a list. That's good. <laughs> uh, so uh, as Kyle mentioned, we use a tool called Code Climate Velocity, which really between that and my evaluation of Git Prime, there are two tools that are relatively new class of applications, but they basically connect to your GitHub and they look at all your pull requests, they look at every line, every contributor, and then they each have their own methods that are backed by data science and different pieces of research that indicate, you know, these, these things correlate with um, higher velocity, higher throughput, better outcomes in engineering organizations. Um, so the main categories are work habits. So this is just basically like how often do engineers push code? So pushes per day, uh, average coding days per week, which is just, you, know, you get one basically if you push one commit per day. Um, PR size is really important there as well. And I think- you know, kind Is that of, like number of commits or lines of code? Number of lines of code in the PR. Uh, and then time to open. Does it evaluate uh, pluses and minuses the same? Yeah, the diff. Um, and then time to open. So from the first commit, the time from the first commit to when the PR is open. Uh, and they've got all kinds of research that I won't go into around, like they say that you know, teams that have uh, lower time to open ship product faster. Uh, it's probably common sense here that like smaller, more bite-sized PRs are easier to review, they go in faster, and 
So that's generally a good practice. Um, code review is another category, so the percentage of PRs that go unreviewed before they're merged, which hopefully should be pretty low. Uh, time to review, so the amount of time between the PR opening and the first review. And then review cycles, which is basically, um, you know, if you, if you leave a comment, leave a review, and there's another commit, there's another comment, that counts as one cycle. Uh, finally, efficiency, so the rework percentage, which looks at uh, a line of code and if it was basically rewritten or if there's another commit on that same line within three weeks that's considered a rework. You know, zero, you don't, you're never gonna have zero because if you have greenfield things, maybe you're writing and then refactoring, it's never, not always a bad thing to have rework, but that number should generally be pretty low. And then uh, abandoned PRs. So all those things together um, are kind of what the tool provides us to look at. And we can talk more and have to answer questions more about like why those matter and how we use them. Okay, so you have a tool, and that's kind of cheating. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we are still tracking at this point what my manager says we have to track. <laughs> um, we are doing, let's see, percentage of planned points completed. So, you know. Um, and then we are also doing kind of our throughput for each sprint, so our velocity. Um, let's see. We, we did track, like, just within our team, one of the things we chose to look at was... Um, how many times a, a ticket was cycled, and like every, every like in the um, retro, we would kind of look at that ticket and evaluate. Okay, well, why did this one get cycled so much? There was obviously something going on here. Maybe we should dive a little deeper and see what was wrong. Um, other than that, we don't really have a lot of metrics that we're looking at right now. So. Does recycle mean go from like one sprint to the next, or what's that? No. So like a cycle ticket, like QA looks at it and it fails, oh, and, it right, gets right, put, right. and it gets kicked back to the developer. So I started on this journey about uh, 18 months. I, I gave a talk at Indie Code last spring about this exact to topic, evaluating engineers. Um, and it was really right before Git Prime came out with their product. And so I'm an idiot and I wrote a bunch of software to do this exact thing. Um, I started pulling commits, uh, looking at messages. I did some integration with our, we used this uh, uh, tracking tool called Yodiz. Um, uh, stupid name, pretty good tool, um, <laughs> um, and trying to look at things like cycle time, uh, commit size, uh, commit frequency, um, all kinds of different things. And um, our metrics change all the time. So we started with those and then uh, so, some metrics come and go. Um, one of the things that I found was that um, I'm, I'm super cautious on what I reward um, and I try to only reward what I measure and so I'll, by corollary I'm cautious of what I measure because engineers um, in general are really good at gaming the system and so as soon as you say this thing is really good I can find a way to get more of those things and really what I want is features um, and, and what the team wants is, is features and I want features that don't break, that people like, there's like, it's kind of complicated. And so uh, that's part of the hard part of the metric, but, but we use those metrics as conversation points more than we do as reward mechanisms. And so we talk about why do some people have uh, fewer larger commits as opposed to lots of small commits? Or what's the average number of commits per PR? and what's easier or harder to use. Um, all of these kinds of things lead us to, to um, good discussion relatively to good, relatively infrequently to good results, but, but lots of good discussion along the way. Like, I'm not sure there's a, a magic metric going there. So uh, we might have two uh, just idiots, is that what you said, that yeah. wrote a lot of code? Um, yeah. So we actually still use a tool that uh, I'm actively working on, um, but I'm looking at it from more, and I know this isn't the exact question, but I'm looking at it more from the entire product development life cycle, right? The cycle time of an entire story. Some of that isn't about the engineers, some of it's about the product manager, the, the product owner, how big did they make it, how cleanly did they define the acceptance criteria of the story, 
um, so on and so forth. So some of the things that we've measured recently on a uh, quantitative basis are things like the review ratio. At one point, we had an issue where it was taking a long time for stories. We're sitting in the waiting for review lane. Um, then we started to look at it and we saw uh, we had a few people on the team who were really killing it when it came to reviews. They would review 200% of the stories that they put in. So if they if they have 10 stories actively in the process or had just been uh, pushed production in within the past two weeks, they were reviewing 20. Um, but then we had others who were reviewing zero, right? That is gonna slow the process down because those people who are reviewing, um, they're spending a lot of their time doing that. It's just inequity, right? So. One of the things that we started measuring was review ratio. Um, and the specific tool that I'm talking about that I've been working on is it measures, the, the core of it is the cycle time of a full ticket. And then it, it takes into account uh, how often certain things get recycled, both from a technical perspective, how many times you have uh, changes requested on a PR versus how many times it needs remediation from a QA standpoint. So uh, I would say, from a metric standpoint, the cycle time for a product team is a really, really good measure. Um, but like you said, uh, I think it's all about starting a conversation, not about um, saying, hey, if you hit, meet this particular number, you get a promotion, or you meet this particular number, even you get a reward. Um, because the goal is the forward progress of the organization as a whole. Um, and you want to make sure that whatever you're measuring takes that into account. So, um, cool. Uh, so a couple of you kind of alluded to, you know, sort of the, you know, the dangers of, of kind of over measurement or, uh, you know, measuring the wrong things. Um, what would you say you should definitely not measure? Like what is the thing that you have thought about or maybe measured in the past that you think is a really bad idea at this point? Lines of code. <laughs> I mean, that just leads to extra code that doesn't really like tell you what anybody is actually doing. Um, in our company, in particular, we had, um, for some reason, and we couldn't figure out why, a lot of the teams were using spikes in a very strange way. <laughs> they were uh, pretty much just using it as an open-ended thing. Like, we don't really know. We're going to do a spike. It could carry over, you know, we can do what we want, we might write some code, we might not, there was no structure around it, and what had happened was we, they had become so rigid around what we could bring into the sprint and what we couldn't, and, um, you know, if you if you didn't, you know, burn down on the way to zero, then, you you know, you, you got in trouble, not in trouble, <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was frowned upon, so I think with all that focus on, um, you know, always burning down to zero and making sure that your sprint was so rigid, it, it led to people deciding that they were going to use spikes because it kind of gave them an out, right? You know, it didn't have points, it was just kind of invisible, so it's like, this gives us a way to do this, this really hard thing that um, we don't really want to call attention to, and it, it became a problem. Some of my early software that I wrote in regards to this was around lines of code. Um, we, I did lots of lines of code measurement to sort of get a feel for what people are doing. Uh, I don't think it's a, actually, it's not a horrible metric. Um, uh, I'm dumb enough to measure anything, so we will talk about all kinds of stuff. So I don't think that, like, I'm not sure there is a bad metric uh, until you, like, the bad metric is the one you use to beat people with. Um, so, like, I think that you can get useful information out of that, right? So, um, but we use things like that. So, uh, we, we try to talk about delivery. Like, what we care most is features delivered. Um, and through our metric process, through looking at lines of code, uh, through looking at day of the week for line, like, we used, uh, so, um, we introduced an idea of, we were like, hey, on Thursdays, we're going to go to no meeting Thursday and it's work from home day. So everyone's gonna work from home on Thursdays and no scheduled meetings on Thursdays. Um, and we were probably, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 weeks into the process and we said, okay, what's the, what day of the week do we think we commit the most lines of code? Everyone was like, ah, it's definitely gonna be Thursday. Nope. Oh, it's Friday, because we carry that over and we actually come out on Friday. Nope, 
not Friday either. It turned out to be Tuesday, completely unrelated to the what everyone would have what everyone did agree was their most productive day, but lines of code just didn't correlate to that. We found we were doing some other really useful things on those days, but it just turned out it wasn't uh, that you know lines of code didn't relate to feature delivery. So. Um, I know I'm holding holding a, a cold climate velocity shirt, but I'm gonna say velocity is dangerous if engineers are measured by. I like what you said there around uh, the metric that you beat people with, right? Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a quick story. I used to work for this place. Uh, we'll call it Colder City. Um, and uh, I believe blue, y'all. I love them. Well, I love them. I'm not talking any shit about them. Uh, but back in the day, way back in the day, way back in the day, we used to get paid per point, right? I want you to think about that for a second. You got paid per point. Um, it, <laughs> well, well here, here's what it did, though. Here's what it did, though. Uh, we didn't get, we didn't get docked. We didn't have clawbacks for bugs, right? If the client accepted the points, we got paid. Right, so if there were bugs in it, not my fucking problem. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, um, would you say awesome? You still say awesome. That is the wrong reaction. Uh, um, as an engineer, but, <laughs> as an engineer, that would be awesome. Uh, and so, if I take it away from the consulting world and I talk about a bad experience I had with that in the FTE or the SaaS company world. Um, this one group, and I did it, right? I'm own up to it. I, you know, I'm not sure I'm a great manager now, but I know I used to be a really <laughs> shitty one. Uh, back then, I would say, um, to be senior, you have to deliver 10 points per week. Um, you know what happened? Those fucking stories got a lot bigger, right? Like, uh, what used to be a one-point story is magically now a five-point story, and uh, magically our velocity is hitting the roof. It is crazy how how crazy our velocity is. If, I mean, we're using story points, so that's the, uh, I think, uh, co-climbing velocity is not talking about story points. They're talking about something else. So I want to be clear about that. I'm specifically talking about story points. Um, so I would say when you have story points that are defined by engineers and uh, whoever else is going through that estimation process and you judge people and you say something dumb like, in senior level engineers have to be delivering 10 points per week, uh, you're gonna get some some interesting uh, uh, salute, uh, outcomes to that, to, that, uh, to that system that you set up, so. Hopefully. That's good. Different kind of blocks. Yeah, <laughs> different kind of blocks. <laughs> well, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, just a bad idea to measure on one metric, period, right? Like there is no silver bullet. This is one thing that my CEO used to come to me a lot about wanting a batting average, you know, and even as much as like three months ago, after we had velocity, I want to have a batting average. You know, I have a batting average for every salesperson. I want a batting average for every engineer. I'm just like, no. Like I just I have to keep hammering home that there there are a series of things, every team is different. Um, what works for one team, what works for one engineer, doesn't work for the next, and we should use a, a bunch of different numbers. As, um, as guiding points uh, to help with conversations, to help initiate conversations, to help identify which teams are stronger in certain areas, which teams need maybe a little more senior firepower versus you know, teams that may be too strong. Um, I, you know, I think any one metric though has to be surrounded by some context. So if you look at like number of bugs fixed, which is another common one with lines of code, people are like, well, that's super easy to game. It is, like you could, if you're a product delivery team, you could be incentivized to write more bugs in your product um, if, you're, if you're measured by how many bugs you fix. But if you're- a, Yeah, it sounds like a Dilbert, <laughs> I haven't seen it, but. Um, if you're a support team and all you do is fix bugs or triage and you fix most bugs, then maybe measuring how many bugs you fixed in the last sprint is a good thing to look at because, you know, did you, did you fix as many as we expected you to based on how many there were. So any metric needs to have context for it to be valuable. Um, and there's never a silver bullet, one metric. Um, 
I guess, does anybody from the audience have a question uh, that they've been thinking about or kind of sitting on, that sort of thing? We have some other things that we can ask, but Should yeah. Uh, sure. So, we're gonna throw a shirt at you if you ask a question. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think Steve already has a hand up. Uh, sorry. Who's doing it? You got it? All right. Thank you. Oh, you want the microphone? Cool. Um, so I think a lot of the metrics we've been talking about are uh, developers' impact on the code base, on the product, uh, but I think a, a big part of a developer's impact on a team is their impact on their fellow developers. Uh, is that something that you guys measure? How can that be measured? Um, yeah, how does that feed into how we measure engineers? Yeah, that's a harder one. I think in terms of like hard quantitative measurement, anything around reviews um, and how many reviews, it, the tool that we use obviously like tracks reviews from GitHub, but it will do it in a way that um, there's different shapes for different people on the team. It's kind of cool so you can like, at a very quick glance you can see like who is in the top 1% based on how much they review and how frequently they, re they review. And it's very easy to see like, um, you know, like shout out to Tony Drake, everybody knows he's awesome. Like he reviewed like 75% of our code in a quarter or something. So like he was involved in just like and so looking at that, um, it it's just it's like how do we clone that guy? You know how do we how do we look at his habits and and you know he's someone that reviews a lot and mentors a lot. How do we you know try to help others uh, move in that direction? So I, I think everything else, just being a good human, being a good team member, those are more qualitative things that are I don't know that we'll ever have data points in them. Uh, I love the concept of 365 or 360 degree review uh, systems. Um, we used to work with this uh, QA person who uh, had a set score for every engineer that they worked with. Um, and that was based on just, based on their experience and the observations that they made about that person, about those people over the course of time, how much that they trust the stories coming through them. Uh, coming from them through uh, their queue, um, which again, you wouldn't want that to be the single source of measurement, but um, when you talk about impact of engineers, it's not, I look at it as not just the impact on other engineers, it's impact on QA, impact on product management. If uh, product management or product ownership have, has to, um, they know when they are dealing with some group of engineers that they have to uh, be really, really explicit, but there's others, they, if they're explicit, they get angry, right? All of those things. So it's not just about the impact on other engineers, it's about the impact on, uh, on everybody around them. Uh, there was this one thing that I used to say a lot, that you should measure a team by its impact on the customers, you should measure the individuals by their impact on their team. And again, if you have a cross-functional squad, your team, aren't just engineers. So uh, it's hard to measure, but I would dare to say that it's the most critical thing that we can measure uh, because it is, uh, at the end of the day, if you have an engineer who cranks great code, but no one wants to work with him for one reason or another, that's not an engineer that you want on your team, right? It's, just, I mean, it's, let me rephrase that. It's not an engineer I want on my team, right? <laughs> Um, so, uh, I would say that that 360 review process, which I have yet to figure out a way to really get a good system there, but that 360 review process is uh, one of the best ways to impact, uh, to measure the impact of an engineer has on all the other members of their team. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer. Um, uh, but, but it made me think about, I recently, I, I have a, a member of my team who is a little more reserved. I have some pretty social people on my team and one, a person who's really um, uh, more reserved than the rest. And and, um, and I started to think that maybe this person wasn't engaged. They didn't, they didn't, uh, they weren't mentoring other engineers, some, a variety of different things. And, um, and then recently we had some other problems uh, and, uh, problems in the loose sense of the word, right? But but uh, we weren't totally engaged in our um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, in our, in our grooming process. And so I went to this, uh, um, I, I started assigning some stories beforehand to individuals to uh, do some pre-work before we came to grooming. And this person who was quiet and reserved started to become an all-star in our grooming process because they were not a sort of just in, like, so my default mode is just in time. Like, uh, I, like, as soon as I hear it, I speak. I, I'm not a deep thinker, I'm a quick thinker. I'm like, preparation beforehand is way too hard. Um, but this person needed time to, to th really think about and ingest what was happening. They needed to think about um, sort of the, the broader ramifications of what we were doing. Um, and, and they came to our grooming sessions with these spectacular uh, um, ways and questions around what the story was doing, what its impact was, what tasks needed to be done, the interrelationship between it and other stories, um, where before they kind of sat in the corner and didn't say a thing and then just, you know, flashed a three at the end and that was it. Um, so it started making me think about um, sort of inner team communication has as much to do with me as it does to do with the individual. You have to find ways, like if a person isn't engaged, um, what are you doing to, as a manager to engage that person in the thing? It's it totally like big old light bulb in my head, like, hey, uh, what you do matters. Um, and you need to think about, like what's one of the valuable things about sort of looking at your team in whole, who's doing well, who's not, and, and finding the things that, that aren't going well and finding ways to, to, to try and get new things out of those people. Um, I just talk to my team <laughs> and listen to what they say. I find that, you know, we can take them aside and do one-on-ones and um, they, they, they tend to open up and give you a lot of feedback and then I try to listen. <laughs> as much as I can and do what I can to fix anything and you know it, it's easier to get bad feedback that way than it is to get good feedback um, I do try to ask questions to get the good feedback as well so. I'll start this one with you, with you Lindsay but uh, I've heard rumors that you are hiring is this correct so hiring three roles uh, right now um, as you think about you know some of the metrics you use today, how do you go about finding people that'll be you know a good fit or a good addition to your team, uh, and how do metric how does measurement play a role in that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm being sold to. <laughs> um, Real subtle. Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I'm I'm not sure that we've actually looked at it from that perspective yet. Um, kind of our hiring process is, you know, are they a good fit for the team? Do they have the right, you know, technical skills? But we just kind of started this new thing where we do um, a code review. Instead of like having someone write a piece of code or whatever, um, Josh put together a, a cool uh, little code review that we can run through with each person. So it's, you know, it's the same thing every time for every person. So it's easy to compare. It's easy to see who can jump in and they know what they're talking about. and. You know, depending on what they point out and how they point it out and their attitude towards it, it's, you can really learn a lot because of the consistency across the metrics. Sorry, that's not, I don't have any metrics. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a really good thing. So, uh, not to plug Woven, but one of my first conversations with Wes, your, your CEO, uh, we sort of started talking about this and he brought this idea of you know, sort of standard rubric to to me where, you know, when you're evaluating people, do you have a standard where you look at, you know, what things you need, what you are good at, what are you not good at? Um, and although I'm not hiring right now, it's, I've really started to think about that as I go into the, to the, to a hiring season eventually, um, trying to understand what things are we good at and what things are we not, and then specifically looking for people who will fill the hole of the things we're not good at. will just straight up plug well. Um, so when we were, when at specifically at Lesson Lee, uh, when I first started there, we, I wanted to not shake the boat too much, rock the boat too much, excuse me, um, and wanted to use a very similar hiring process that we had used up until that point. So uh, we had a take-home test, so we revised the take-home test, 
and we put together this rubric of the things that we're looking for um, within that. But what I what we came to find was that because uh, we had different people grade that every time, it was really really difficult to be able to discern uh, what was going on there. Right? I would have two people grade one of these uh, take home tests and and. One would come back, hell yeah, the other would come back, hell no, oh, what is happening? Um, so, and again, a straight up plug, so it's a really good question. Um, Woven was created, uh, tried to hire these guys, but they decided to create a company. I'm just a little bitter. Um, <laughs> tried to hire them first. You tried to hire them first? I think we all probably did. Uh, um, but they, when we first got that pitch, the thing that was most attractive was we could still deliver something. I also really hated uh, using up a, a bunch of time for people who weren't paying for that time. That made me feel really shitty, but um, uh, not shitty enough not to do it, but uh, it did make me feel really shitty. Um, so when they were like, in an hour, we can uh, tell you not just from a coding standpoint, uh, a competency level, but also, um, if you ever take those tests, it starts off with something that's a little more qualitative and how you communicate with other engineers, that score now means so much to me, right? It, it's one of the factors. It's not the only factor, I wanna be clear, because that would be unfair, but it is an important, important factor. So you get back this score, and just waiting for it. Ah, 85, all right, definitely bring them in, and we'll take them through the interview process, need a validator, invalidate that number, then they come back and they say, hey, is this, you know, how did this work out, so on and so forth. So we're constantly calibrating for the changes, um, but uh, given the fact that that number is based on not just uh, hardcore skills and competencies, but also uh, the cultural aspect, which is really, really important, more important, I would dare to say, for Lessonly, um, uh, using something like that is, is really, really great for consistency more than anything. I mean, there's a lot of great things about it, but consistency. I wouldn't want a single engineer, I wouldn't want Steve to grade everybody because he'd probably hate me and quit and I can't have that. So um, having paying somebody to, to be consistent with that feedback is phenomenal. So we do the old school way, it's the MSI. Miles Theret Index. Oh. <laughs> uh, so that's my first check. Second one is the TDI, the Tony Drake Index. Can you tell us about these indexes? Yeah, so I'll tell you about Tony because he never will tell you somebody's good, but he'll tell you like they don't suck or like they're an okay human being. Uh, or no red flags. He'll use that one a lot, but he'll never say like yeah, they're really good. Um, so that's the TDI. Uh, I just made both of those up on the fly. I don't know. I mean, we use Woven too. They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question on that? Oh, over. Oh. Yes. So you were talking about metrics. That, that's all right. Oh, that's too, <laughs> too <laughs> overthrown. <laughs> you were yeah. wearing the shirt, huh? Yeah, I got that at uh, ERP. Um, you are talking about the metrics that Woven provides. I know you use it. Um, I didn't really pick up. Oh, the woven elevator pitch? That's right. Oh man, I, I gotta practice this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to VC speed dating tomorrow, so I definitely have to practice. Oh, yeah, this. yeah, you're on the car. Yeah, so uh, we're working with a lot of you know companies, like a couple of these up here, a couple of these that don't know it yet, but we will be working with them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so uh, we help companies kind of design standardized uh, ways to find people who are going to be really good fits for their team or really good additions to their team. Um, like Andrew kind of alluded to, we do a mix of like technical evaluation, but also uh, non-technical sort of uh, technical collaboration. We have a category called team coding. You know, it's kind of about how people use, you know, uh, GitHub and Trello and some of these other tools. Um, so our goal is to kind of save hiring managers time uh, and, you know, help them also uh, not weed people out who don't look great on a resume. Um, we were really excited today when one of our customers hired somebody that they said, you know, I probably would have thrown this one out in a resume. Because uh, they were a uh, you know smelly Ball State grad or something, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they're actually really good. So, um, yeah. 
And we're at the bottom of the elevator. Oh, I thought you were saying the bottom of the K. No, no, so, no. Sorry. All right, see everybody. Still <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah. I think, uh, I think Garrett, had, Garrett had a question. I, I'm wondering how you, if you're going to um, compare engineers, how do you keep, there's always the gaming, um, but then there's also the possibility to create divisiveness on a team. Uh, you know, somebody's picking up stories that are ranked something that you consider kind of light, or those are you know quick hits. You know, they're going to kick, they're going to do 15 points of quick hits, and you're going to pick up the 13 pointer, which has the higher possibility of blowing through. And just uh, but that's one question I always have. And the other question I have is, when anybody's doing metrics, they, they're doing all this work and collecting all this data. And I always wonder, is it really worth the time invested in collecting all these matrix? Are you really getting the value out of it that you are for the time having put into it? Sure. I'll take this one. Uh, so uh, we do a couple things. So we uh, actually abandoned the sprint model and went Kanban. Um, and uh, we f force engineers to pick top of the backlog. Um, and so uh, lots of things going in that to, again, decrease cycle time, get features out the door, and you're always picking the next step. And so at any time you can pair with someone else, you think it's too big, you can you know, pull someone along with you. But we try to encourage to, to always take from the top of the backlog regardless of what's up there. And we're, we're pretty uh, rigorous in our sorting of, of backlog to make sure that the most important things at the top. Um, and sometimes things change and you go out and, and but but that's the, the one of the keys is that you essentially like we don't have yeah these nine stories need to get in this week and so you can work any nope you pull the back of the top of the backlog all the time because you don't know if tomorrow that same story is going to be it. so that's one of the ways we try to evaluate that um, and, and I'm kind of with you that uh, it's questionable whether or not uh, the amount of time I put into writing the software turned into enough value. Um, the value for me came in conversation, and I think I can get, you know, sort of 80% of the value out of just straight conversation. Uh, we get lots of interesting things that lead to more conversation uh, from the metrics that are available, from the data that we're pulling. Um, but I think there are, I think you said it right, right? Just ask questions and listen, and you probably get most of the things um, that you get out of that. Um, Andrew and I were talking before about stack ranking, whether or not it's a good thing to stack rank your engineers. Um, and uh, I, I think as a, as a public, hey, here's the list of the, uh, you know, of the six best engineers on our team, and you can see where, like, I'm not sure that that, that creates the kind of culture that I want to be a part of. Um, but I think if you were to ask any engineer on your team, hey, if you had uh, one guy you had to work with or one gal you had to work with for the next six months, who would you pick? Um, people know who sort of the, the, the best engineer is or who the, the, you know, who they like to work with the most. And so people kind of know those things. And, and I think the, the skill becomes how do you get them to all work together so that everyone's, you know, so it's a rising tide left in all boats. Uh, yeah, I mean, on the point of story points, like, we don't measure that. Um, you know, I think when it comes to gaming the system, like, the things I that we... Story points is one measure. I'm just, like, any measure that you're going to rank engineers against yeah. each other, against is a strong word, but right. uh, it's going to, I'm worried it would become divisive. So, that, I'm just, that's, it doesn't have to be just points. I'm just sure. like, how you handle any measure. Of yeah, so I'll take, like, uh, average coding days per week, which is, we do have like a leaderboard in Velocity, everybody has access to it. Um, and people will uh, make kind of cynical jokes like, oh, I gotta get my stats up, gotta get my stats up. But we've talked about this before, like gaming the system, all you're doing is, all right, I'm, get, I'm gonna game the system. So that means I'm gonna push more frequently, I'm gonna make smaller PRs, I'm gonna review more code, and I'm gonna pay attention to how much I'm reworking my system code. So like by gaming the system, you are becoming a better developer. You're, you're practicing better development habits. And so game the system all you want. It's like you're, you're going to become better for it, and the team's going to become better for it. Um,
before we exposed the leaderboard to everybody, we had a lunch and learn, we sat down and we really went through the metrics and the why behind them and that they weren't going to be used as a stick, but they were for everyone to kind of have visibility into the different teams and how they're, uh, how they're performing and that we would never use them in a manner that would like, you know, put somebody on a performance improvement plan. It would always be used as a carrot and something that we want to use to drive conversations. So uh, we haven't seen divisiveness out of that. Um, our, you know, I, I think our cultures generally, everyone kind of gives each other the benefit of the doubt. Everybody knows, everybody wants to do good work. Um, it's just actually by making these metrics public, I have seen an uptick in, in just good habits and more consistency across the board. Um, so, um, <clears throat> some of the metrics. So, one of my favorites, and it can definitely be gamed if it's used as a stick, is the review ratio one. Kind of back to the story I was saying earlier. If you have certain metrics that are, if the metric goes up, it is you being a better teammate, and it's not the meritocracy style metrics. I think that that is that has a lot of value. Has a lot of value. But when you start talking about actual career progression, right? Evaluating engineers, who gets a raise, who gets a promotion, who gets a title change. Which, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like is the essence of the divisiveness. If if I uh, and then if I have uh, if I do the 10 points per um, per week, then I'm a senior, right? Those are the type of things um, that can be divisive. So I would say the that evaluation process of how do you progress and grow within the organization from uh, a compensation and, and title perspective has to include significantly more than just metrics. It, 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 matter of fact, um, so uh, this is very, very, uh, dear to me, number one, because I'm obsessed with the topic overall, but number two, uh, we at Lesson Lear are at that stage now with around 15, 16 engineers where it's time, we can't just, um, we can't just guess at it anymore. You have to be a little more clear about what our expectations are. Um, and so I've been looking around for how other people are doing it, and I've become, I am just head over heels in love with them. Second, uh, the Medium team, um, they put together this whole career progression journey framework. Uh, I would implore every engineering manager in the audience and on the panel to go and check that thing out because what they do is it's a panel of peers that uh, say, okay, you're at milestone one on this particular track. Um, are you ready for milestone two? And they have very clear uh, ways to say, to, to make that judgment call. Then there's an the appeals process and uh, where you bring in an outside expert to come in and help with that. Um, and those milestones aren't necessarily directly associated with a title change, it's the accumulation of those. And not everybody's gonna go down one track, right? So that, I believe the way that they've done it is inoculating themselves from the dis divisiveness that can happen with any of these growth frameworks or any of these ladder Frameworks. They specifically use growth because saying ladder means one is above the other. But um, so you start to see the shape of an engineer isn't the same because you're not looking for the exact same thing over and over and over again. Uh, I would say some companies aren't looking for the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so I would say it has to be uh, clear expectations. The the measures have to be things that positively impact the teammates, so you don't get that meritocracy feel. Um, and then if those milestones are uh, judged in a way that um, is transparent and fair, uh, one good way to do that is with a panel if you have enough people. Um, I think those are some really good ways to inoculate yourself from the divisiveness there. But as soon as you say, here are the one or two measures and we're gonna judge everybody on, and if you get these measures high enough, I don't know how you get away from uh, a very, toxic culture. So we do not track anything at an individual level currently. Um, at least not that I would admit. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Is anybody on your team in the audience? Y yes. yes <laughs> no. no, we don't. Um, and then to answer your other question about the time that we spend collecting the metrics, I would say that anything that has come from the top down saying, hey, you should track this, it's usually a pain in the ass to figure out and it adds little value. I mean, every once in a while, yes, um, but for the most part, it doesn't. But anything that kind of the team comes up with and they're like, hey, I wonder if we're doing this or maybe we should look at what we're doing around these things. Um, those tend to be very useful and much easier to measure. Right, so I think we're getting, uh, I think we're getting close to time, possibly. I, uh, I see one hand in the back. Uh, I feel compelled to. Yeah, what, what's your question? I, I was just going to ask, um, this was touched on a little bit earlier. There's no one single metric that you can measure. You know, people up above are saying, hey, what's the batting average for your, for your team or you know, for the individuals? Um, given that software development is not like working in a factory where you measure the number of widgets that somebody produces or how many hours they have their career in a chair, um, how do you convince something with a more traditional Taylorism kind of mindset, factory kind of mindset, how do you convince them these, these kinds of metrics are actually relevant? How do you convince them that, you know what, number of lines of code written isn't necessarily a good way to measure a developer because anybody could write thousands of lines of crap. Um, it takes talent to take out thousands of lines of code and make the, the product better. So how do you convince these people with a traditionalist Taylor is a mindset that their metrics don't fly. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, those people, and I'm generalizing too, right? I'm talking about the C-suite usually. Yeah. Uh, the things that they care about are that is the impact of the product and engineering department. So the way I usually look at it is, what would make you cheer, right? If we are on a quarterly cadence, what would make you scream hell yeah at the end of this quarter? And let's focus all of our energy on that. Do you trust me to make the decisions on what I need and, and I can give you return on investment and all the rest of that? If you trust me to do that, you just don't need to worry about how we're dealing with, with this, um, uh, with the career progression stuff. Uh, I want to know what your expectations are of the team. Like I said earlier, you want to judge a team by its impact on customers or impact on the business. You want to judge individuals by the impact on the team. And you need leadership that can uh, enforce that rule. Um, I don't know if you can, I, I, so I guess what I'm saying is I just wouldn't have the debate. Right? I would just tell them, hey, here is, here, here's what you need from me, and, right, do the Jedi mind uh, here's what you need from me, here's what I'm telling you I need in order to get this thing done. Um, and if there isn't trust there, then I think the whole situation is kind of fucked up to begin with, right? Like, I don't know if it's worth repairing, um, but if you can get that trust, uh, I think that's the best way to do it. talk about it is, talk about the business outcomes that you want to see, and let me help you get there. So that would be my answer. Yeah, for us it was um, it was benchmarking. So um, not to sound like a broken record, but Velocity has a benchmarking tool in it that shows you in your metrics where you stack up against the industry. And uh, so the day that I was able to walk into my boss's office and say, "Look, we achieved 4.7 coding days a week last quarter, and that's in the top five percent." his eyes just lit up and then we were at this all company meeting like two weeks later and he said our engineering team's in the top one percent of engineering teams in the country and that was the happiest day of my life um, so all it took was you know he didn't know what we needed and what metrics and the, and the guy is super smart super visionary but he's not an engineer he's not a technology guy he doesn't come from that background so he just knew we wanted to measure he wanted to measure and so for me to go to him and say, look, here's data science, here's research, here's a tool that spits it out, here's where we stack up against everybody else, um, that, that just made my life really easy. I would just say, great question, so. <laughs> yeah, the thing I would say to that is, uh, for me, I, I try to live in a world of hope, not in a, not in a, in a world of fear. Um, and we try to promote 
uh, that the things we're doing are, are being used to lift people up, not tear people down. Um, and and kind of like Andrew, like if that's the conversation that I'm having is that I, I got to have that metric, I, I've probably lost my, my battle already. Um, and so uh, again, right, try and, try and change the conversation, the things that matter, um, or play the Jedi mind trick, like here's the real metric you want to see and here's why we're awesome at it. Um, but in general, that's a, just a horrible conversation to be a part of. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're getting close to time, so I wanted to ask one last question. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of people in the audience today are, you know, aspiring maybe to be uh, managers in the, in the future. So, um, if you had one piece of advice, what would you give to somebody who's like new to management or leadership in a company? And I don't know who is, maybe we can start here. <laughs> Um, wow. Uh, so, um, I, I would say uh, be open, honest, and transparent. Whatever it is you, you're doing, tell your team what you're doing, why you're doing. Uh, be quick to admit when you fail and, and why you suck. Um, I, I don't know any uh, people in general, let alone engineers, who don't. Uh, rally around people who are open and transparent, have high empathy and love. Uh, those things uh, go a, a really long way to becoming a good manager. So I would say always listen to your team and um, just all I try to do is just make everything as good as I possibly can for them and then they're successful. Um, well, there's a lot that I could say here. I mean, I, I think the first thing that came to mind was just, uh, you're never going to be ready. Like, just jump in whenever you can get the opportunity, if you really think you want to do it, and just be ready to screw up a lot, um, and be willing to screw up and be embarrassed and say stupid shit, and, you know, you're going to be in a one-on-one, -on -one, you're not going to be empathetic about something when you should have been, and it's just going to take time and lots of conversations to get to a point where you feel like, all right, I can at least do, walk into work today and not be like a bumbling <laughs> idiot at my job. Uh, so that's that's one piece. The other thing is um, I try to do this thing every morning where I check myself before I really get started. Like, what am I looking forward to today? What am I anxious about today? And then am I my best self today? Am I able to be my best self for my team? Some days the answer is no. Sometimes I just need to stay home and not go in because as the leader, as a manager, you you have such an impact that people are watching you and uh, you just, you gotta check yourself every day. Um, make sure that you're the best you can be that day. That is a really good, really tough question. Um, the answers I'm gonna give, I learned at Leslie. Um, one, uh, an engineer, uh, on the team brought this book to our organization called Nonviolent Communication, which if you're like me, you hate the title of that book because it sounds really icky, really, oh, what is nonviolent communication? But um, I read it and it, it literally changed uh, so much. And I, I, it's more, much more than what I'm about to tell you, but uh, the biggest thing that I took away from it is instead of making judgments instead of saying this engineer always does this or you always do that or uh, I hate it when you do X, Y, or Z. Um, switch it around to observations, right? So make observations of say, I see that uh, you, you the last three days in your standup, you've been saying that you are gonna deliver this story and I need to have that story delivered in order to be able to complete this other thing, is there some way that I can help as opposed to, uh, you kind of suck because this is the third day in a row that you've been saying the same shit, right? Like, um, making observations is... <laughs> the second one's not about it? Uh, um, that's how I used to talk to my team back when I first started. It was really bad. It was really bad. Um, but. Uh, Making observations is, is critical. I think that's one of the top things that I would tell any aspiring engineer is get really, really good at not passing judgment at people because they don't like that. I, if I look at you and say, uh, your code is okay, but it can be better, 
um, that go that falls flat. They they feel like you're judging them. But if you say, um, uh, I see that you had three recycles. So this gets back to some of those metrics. I see that you had three recycles on that story, and four recycles on this story, and five recycles on that story. How can I help? Right. That that puts you in a point of conversation with that person where uh, it's not a, a judge be judged scenario. Um, the other thing I would say is just be really vulnerable. Like like we, everybody up here has said, um, it's gonna be hard, but uh, you're, so long as you have the right intentions and you, you really want to see people grow and excel, uh, you're gonna do great. It's, it's gonna be okay. Um, uh, get a good mentor, get good mentors uh, that can help you. Um, join a peer group. That, we have been in a couple peer groups, they've been great. Um, but above all else, just um, I would approach every interaction uh, thinking about how the empathy, right? Putting yourself in the other person's shoes and what would you want them to say to you? So even before you're a manager, talk in that way so that when you become a manager, you're already used to it. Uh, and I guarantee you, I won't guarantee much, but I guarantee you, your team will appreciate that from you. So, that is mine. Cool. Well, thank you, all of our panelists, for your time tonight. If we could give them a little round of applause. Here. We still have a couple sure. of code climate shirts up here. Really, really small shirt. You're a small person. Uh, so uh, come find the panelists afterwards. Okay, Matt's Thank just going to throw his. Uh, <laughs> come, come have an actual conversation with Lindsay and earn your shirt. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you to Code Climate for sponsoring and providing the t-shirts. Uh, thanks to Steve for driving here from Cincinnati to deliver the t-shirts, uh, and to also be on the panel. It was just really short. <laughs> uh, there's still probably more pizza. I don't know. I have them back there. Uh, Davey, do you have anything that you would like to add? Anything else? Are we done? So yeah, Ruby. <laughs> yeah, Ruby. Yeah. yeah. Hey. All right. Well, stick around, hang out, drink, eat, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>